Right. That's the, the trouble of leaving verse 12 over is you get to get a second <laughs> instalment um, from me this morning. But again, this will be a bit shorter um, because you've had some already. But let, let's uh, if you're in Matthew's Gospel, do you just turn on a few pages to chapter 24? And we're just going to read a couple of verses uh, to begin with. Quite a sobering passage from Jesus in Matthew 24. And I'm going to jump in at verse 9 um, of Matthew 24. Having predicted in the couple of verses beforehand that nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom and there'll be famines, there'll be earthquakes and so on, and describing those as the beginning of birth pains, Jesus says then in verse 9, you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death and you'll be hated by all nations because of me. At that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other. And many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. So flick back to Matthew 7, but with those words um, in our mind, Jesus has, had been asked by the disciples, you know, what will be the sign of your coming? What will be the sign of the end of the age? And Jesus then begins to speak of the kind of signs, the, the signposts, the things that will happen. And it's interesting, isn't it, that one of the signs in amongst all of, the, all of those other ones that we just read is that he says many false prophets will appear and will deceive many people. So that's something that Jesus flags up is will be happening um, as the end and as his king, as his coming draws nearer. A uh, prophet is basically really a messenger, someone who comes to speak and is claiming to speak on God's behalf. Uh, they're relaying his message. And as a result, prophets will tend to have um, a group of hearers, uh, maybe a small group, maybe a, a church congregation, it may be a Christian organisation, um, of course, there may be some sort of author, and so there is a, a readership out there that are listening to their words. There could be a podcaster or a YouTuber or have some sort of internet platform these days. That The sort of options are of, of, of broad, aren't they, and vast now. Um, and so you've got that sense here in Matthew 7 of the, of the true prophet and the false prophet. You have those that could teach and bring God's word that, that will strengthen and mature people in their faith, or you have those that will teach, that will actually ultimately deceive and lead people astray. And Jesus' is call here right at the beginning of verse 15 is to watch out for false prophets, watch out for them. And most of what Jesus says here, and in many ways there's nothing particularly challenging mentally for our brains in this passage, most of what Jesus says in this passage is about recognising a false prophet or a false teacher. And it's not always easy. Um, it's funny, when I was preparing this in the week, I, w- I was about to say, some things, of course, are obvious. Some situations come along where somebody clearly has the words false prophet sort of embraced on their jack- jacket and, and there on the, on the front of them it says false prophet. It's very obvious is what I was going to say. So some people may well come along and say, you know, Jesus was a good man, but he's not God. False prophet. Not true. Very obvious. Some would come along and say that Jesus is one way to God among many ways. False prophet, clearly not true, according to what the Bible has to say. Others may come along and say Jesus did not really, you know, he was not really raised from the dead. False prophet. Or that Jesus didn't do the miraculous things that he did. A sort of a clear kind of denial of what's clearly written in Matthew's Gospel, Mark, Luke, John. False prophet. And yet, weirdly, people believe them. I think that's the thing in the the week. I was going to say, these things are obvious. These are false prophets that you spot a mile off. And yet, bizarrely, people do believe them and follow them and are deceived. So you'd think they were obvious. But often, it really is much more difficult. Notice what Jesus says in verse 15. Watch out for false prophets. They come to you, says Jesus, in sheep's clothing. 
They look like one of God's sheep. They look like one of God's people on first look. And perhaps much of what, much of what they're saying may well be true and biblical and orthodox. Much of it, but not all of it. It's a little bit like where's Wally in the sort of the true and false prophet world. You know, where on earth are they? They look like the real deal. They look like one of God's sheep. And Jesus warns here in this first verse 15 that although they look genuine, they look like a sheep, they are in fact a ferocious wolf. I think one of the things that is amazing about Jesus' teaching is just how vivid the imagery is. You can imagine, can't you, a wolf in amongst a sheep pen? Uh, Pauline, you've spoken before, haven't you, Pauline, about, um, was it a fox getting in, either in with the ducks or chickens or something? up at your house and I remember you sort of relaying that and, and the image is stark isn't it you don't have to see it to imagine the carnage to imagine the feathers to imagine the death that comes and the and the noise in that sort of scenario of a fox getting in among the chickens or the ducks and Jesus takes that image and here they come to you he says in sheep's clothing they look like one of the sheep but inside it's not just you know, Jesus' language is so vivid, isn't it? They are ferocious wolves. Is how Jesus describes them. Paul uh, picks this up in um, in Acts chapter seven, uh, Acts chapter twenty. He spent a bit of time with some church leaders in a place called Ephesus, and he's about to to leave them. And these are some of the final words he says. He says, "I know that after I leave you, savage wolves will come in among you." and will not spare the flock. Even from your own number, men will arise and distort the truth and draw away disciples after them. So be on your guard, he says to the church leaders there. Remember that for three years I never stopped warning each of you, night and day with tears. So this is a very, very real and present danger that Jesus says in the the end times, many false prophets will come and deceive many. So, verse 15, watch out for them. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. They will do terrible damage. And notice in Paul's words to the Ephesian elders, these people will distort the truth. That's the phrase that Paul uses. They will distort the truth and they will gather disciples after them. Now, I thought it'd be useful just this morning just to hear a couple of other um, New Testament passages on this. Just listen as I just read a couple of them. They're mainly from Peter's letters and then something from 2 Corinthians. But just listen out for what these wolf sheep you know, are, how they operate. Peter writes, there were also false prophets among the people. I think he means in the Old Testament, just as there will be false teachers among you. They will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the sovereign Lord who bought them. Swift destruction, bringing swift destruction on themselves. Many will follow their shameful ways and will bring the truth into disrepute. In their greed, these teachers will exploit you with stories they've made up. Their condemnation has been long hanging over them. These men are springs without water, mists driven by a storm. Blackest darkness is reserved for them, for they mouth empty, boastful words, and by appealing to the lustful desires of sinful human nature, they entice people who are just escaping from those who live in error. They promise them freedom, while they themselves are slaves of depravity. For a man is a slave to whatever has mastered him. And then Paul, when he's writing to the church in Corinth, says uh, this, he says, Such men are false prophets, deceitful workmen, masquerading as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. It's not surprising then, if his servants masquerade as servants of righteousness, uh, their end, sorry. No wonder, for Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. It's not surprising then, if his servants masquerade as servants of righteousness. There's a lot of stuff actually in there. Um, They're sheep-like, sheep lookalikes, 
but they mouth empty words. Um, they make substance less promises. They promise, they'll promise their listeners great things that actually in the end of the day won't materialise. There's nothing in them. And it's a lovely image again, isn't it? They're like springs of water. Imagine sort of walking through a desert or you're, you know, you're, you're parched on, in this wonderful hot balmy summers you know, here in Britain and you're ploughing through the fields and you're parched and there in the distance you see a spring of water. It's a lovely image, isn't it? It's, it's refreshing. It's going to nourish you. It's going to give you what you need. But, but uh, Peter, when he writes, says, when you get there, there's no water. So they present themselves as springs of living water that will nourish you and feed you and satisfy you, but there's nothing there. They're greedy, they're exploitative, they promise freedom, and this is absolutely the key. They, they appeal to the lustful desires, says Peter, of our sinful nature. So as they're promising great freedom, they are tapping into what our sinful nature actually ultimately desires and wants. They give our itching, they tell our itching ears what they want to hear, is how Paul puts it in 2 Timothy. We will want what they are saying to be true because it connects with our sinful nature and what our self, our sinful nature wants. So again, just a couple of other things. So as you look through the New Testament, some of the big things that loom as challenges. Greed is is something our our sinful nature wants. We we want things, so it's no surprise, is it? As you look around the world, that the prosperity gospel, false teachers promising perfect health and healing, perfect wellness restored to you, wealth, prosperity, you know, the following after these teachers is enormous because they're tapping in to the lustful desires of our sinful nature. We want those things, and they promise that they can give them to us. And as one by one comes to the spring of water, eventually you realise there is no water. In 2 Timothy, Paul says, in the last days people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, lovers of pleasure. So any kind of false teaching, and false teachers you'd think would tap into this, it's all about self, It's all about, come to me, come to my teaching. I will make you your best you. You will live your best life. You want pleasure morally. They will distort the word of God in order to appeal to our sinful desires. So suddenly, things that we thought were off the table, as far as God were concerned, are actually, in fact, on the table. They are available to us, according to to these false teachers. In the context of the Sermon on the Mount here, they will be those, can you you picture last week, Jesus talked about, didn't he, a narrow gate and and a broad gate, or a wide gate, leading to a narrow way, leading to a broad way. One leads to life, one leads to destruction. What I think you will notice with these false teachers is that the narrow way is not so narrow when you listen to them. There'll be something that will be broadening the narrow way as they teach. But Jesus' main point in this paragraph is how we will recognise them. How do we recognise a false prophet or a false teacher? And Jesus says it twice to make sure we don't miss it. Verse 16 By their fruit, you will recognise them. And then verse 20, thus, by their fruit, you will recognise them. And Jesus gives a quick gardening lesson. um, And it's lovely, I can understand this, it's simple. Jesus says, a good tree will bear good fruit, and a bad tree will will bear bad fruit, and a good tree can't bear bad fruit, and a bad tree can't bear good fruit. So it's nice and simple if you're, if you're like me and you don't know much about your garden. The fruit will tell you about the tree. Now, he throws in an extra comment about grapes and figs. So look at verse 16. By their fruit you will recognise them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? I would imagine most of us could answer that question. No, they don't. 
But there's a bit more in it than this, and again, I'll read you a little bit from this um, commentary, which I think just gives us a bit more of an insight into what Jesus is saying. Don Carson writes, In Jesus' day, everybody knew that the buckthorn had little black berries which could be mistaken for grapes. And there was a thistle whose flower from a distance might be mistaken for a fig. But no one would confuse the buckthorn and the grape once he started to use the fruit to make some wine. No one would be taken in by thistle flowers when they came to eating figs for supper. So it's quite a useful thing. Jesus is doing a little bit more than you'd think. You know, he's not just saying, no, of course we wouldn't you know, mix those up. What Jesus seems to be saying here is that from a distance, they, they look similar. The wolf is in sheep's clothing. But when you come to actually eat the fruit or deal with the fruit, then you won't mix them up. So he's just underlining his message that the fruit will tell you something about the tree. Now, I want to just add one cautionary note in here before I then just give you some very quick applications of this. We need to be a little bit careful in this because all Christians still sin. So, you know, you, you, you might have listened to what I've said so far and Marilyn and Sarah and Pierre have stood up. They've picked me up by my hands and feet. They've marched me out the front door and they've thrown me out of the church and they said, we've seen your fruit. Now, we need to be careful. All Christians still sin, and all Christians will sin until the day they die. Let's be clear about that. We're far from perfect. The fact that the previous passage that we talked about earlier, verses 7 to 11, are seek not. We are seeking and asking for the righteousness that as yet we don't have. So be careful about that, and don't forget chapter 7, verse 1, when it comes to all of us, do not judge or you too will be judged. We need to be very careful that we don't just go on some sort of witch hunt because it will basically mean that there are no Christian leaders left in the land because we all still sin. So we need to be a little bit careful of that. But what Jesus is saying here is that you know that a false teacher or a false prophet is, is a wolf and not a sheep because ultimately they don't know Jesus Christ. The tree's bad. They, they don't know him. They don't actually know the Lord Jesus. They don't know their sins forgiven. They've not had his righteousness credited to their account. And because he is now in their heart, they're pursuing righteousness. That's not the case with these people. And Jesus seems to be saying, because the root, because the tree is not right, eventually that will become obvious in the fruit, really obvious in the fruit. So watch out, by their fruit you will know them. And as I say, that's not the occasional slip-up, that's the fact that the heart, the tree, is, is wrong with God, it's bad. And in time, that sheep disguise will begin to be seen for what it is, a disguise. So it's not easy, it's not quick, but we need to be on our guard and we need to be looking Now, I want to just finish with some very, I think, quite practical things just to take away this morning. Firstly, how how are we best prepared in this this zone? Surely, number one is that we need to know the Lord and grow in our knowledge of him. That's the ultimate thing. The better we know the Lord Jesus, the better we know him, that we are going to begin to um, develop what I've called biblical ears. The better we know Jesus, the more biblical, more Jesus-attuned our ears will be. And hand in hand with that, number two, is that we need to be Christians who love and devour God's word. We want people that love to hear him speak. We need to camp in God's word. Love it. That's the other psalm I was going to read when we started this morning. Devour it. Let it shape you. Now, there are lots of ways we can get into God's word. From time to time we say this. There are daily reading notes, things, tools that can help you help me to get our Bibles open regularly and listening to what God's saying. I always say this, I've been saying this for 13 years, if you find that hard, adopt whatever we're doing, whatever book it is on a Sunday morning, and, and just immerse yourself in it a bit each day, a verse or two, read it, pray about it, pray that God would put it into your heart and into your mind, into your life. Now, the, ben- the benefit of that, and I'm not, I'm pleased to do other things as well, but the benefit of that means that if we'd been doing that for the last couple of years, 
like a piece of rock, if we were sliced open, you'd see the wisdom of, of Hebrews pumping through your veins. The 13 chapters that that author said, and that we've dipped into on Sundays and in growth, group, growth groups, but that you have mine day in and day out will be shaping such biblical hearing. And the truths of Habakkuk will just be part of your DNA. And if in the last few weeks you'd camped in Matthew 7, this stuff is in you and shaping you. So know the Lord, grow in our knowledge of him, love and devour his word. Therefore, number three, be discerning, test everything by his word. The Bible speaks of a spirit of wisdom and a spirit of discernment. The Holy Spirit, believe it or not, works in tandem with the word that the Spirit has spoken. The two go together and as we seek that spirit of wisdom and spirit of discernment, then the word given by the Spirit will have shaped us and is equipping us. Number four, Paul writing to young Christian leader Timothy told Timothy to watch his life and his doctrine closely. If we're going to be keeping our eye out for true and false prophets, true and false teachers, you'd be looking for people and expecting people who are, and leaders who are watching their life and their doctrine closely, both. That the fruit of the way they live is important to them, as is having the right belief, you know, truth, life and doctrine together. Are they teaching the narrow way? Or are they broadening out? Number five, I've put here, know your leaders, know your teachers. Think stranger danger from school. The internet means, doesn't it, at any time, but during a pandemic, we can sit under teaching from anywhere in the world. You can tune in to Sunday services from any, most parts of the planet. You can listen uh, to podcasts, you can listen to things, you can watch it on YouTube. You, our access now to Bible teaching is, is phenomenal. And I would say, make wise use of it. But beware the fact that what you and I get in that route is we get the words of the teacher, but we don't tend to see the life of the teacher. Hard, isn't it, to spot the fruit? Do you see what I mean? You get the voice, you get the words, you get the teaching. But Jesus says, watch out for false prophets. They come in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By your fruit, by their fruit, you will recognise them. So I think we need to be just an extra layer of, of thoughtfulness and caution about what we're consuming, because we don't tend to see the fruit. So we might want to see who, who else sits under them and, and all of that sort of thing. Number six, pr please pray for church leaders. Pray for uh, teachers. Pray that they would have the discernment that Jesus is speaking of here. When, when Paul left those Ephesian elders, he charged those Ephesian elders to guard the flock to watch out for those false teachers that will come in, to watch out for those that will arise from within your number and distort the truth. It, it was those elders' responsibility to protect the precious flock of God's people. So do pray for church leaders across the world in that. And just finally, can I just say, you know, don't downplay the danger of this. Again, just a cultural observation. We're living in times, aren't we, where truth is ero uh, the erosion of truth uh, it's, it's wrong for us to be overly sure about things anymore. And we need to be aware that actually that's a wonderful opportunity, isn't it, for false teaching? Because it, we, we're almost now being programmed to think that to identify something as being wrong and unbiblical is a wrong thing to do. Who do you think you are to... So we need to be very aware that Jesus is speaking here about a situation where the fox, the ferocious wolf, will come in and will bring carnage and destruction and death if left unchecked. This, this is a serious topic um, this morning and we need to be very, very much on our guard and watching out for false prophets and false teachers. Jesus says one of the signs of the end of the age is that false prophets will come, deceive many and lead them astray. So it's a, it's, a, it's a hard word, but I think something we do need to, to take on board and, and, and think through. Um, let me pray for us, and then we'll, we'll hand back to, to our musicians.
Father, we do pray this morning that you would, uh, Lord, guard us from, from becoming people that go on some sort of witch hunt, from those that are going to become judgmental in a way that the beginning of chapter 7 uh, warns us against. Lord, help us not to fall into that error. Father, at the same time, we pray we would be those that love you, that love your words, that see that in your words there is a real spring of life, there is real nourishment, there is real uh, satisfaction, that, Lord, your truth will set us free. But, Father, help us to be aware that there will be those, Lord, for whatever reasons, Father, that will look to exploit others, take followers after themselves, perhaps make a name for themselves, make money for themselves, whatever it might be, Lord, by distorting your truth and leading people into error. So, Lord, give us, give us biblical ears, we pray. Help us to be thoroughly shaped by your word, that we would also, Lord, in all of this, be those that are humble and gracious and merciful. Lord, help church leaders, we pray, around the world, Lord, those that you've called into those positions, whether of a church or a small group or youth and children, whatever it might be, Lord, give these people a, a, a faithfulness to your word, a faithfulness to you to teach the truth, to teach the narrow way, and Lord, to seek their strength to do that in you. Father, take us, I pray, into this week, being those that want to, to listen to you every day, that your truth would shape and fashion us. Help us to find out a way to do that, that you might grow us and strengthen us in your likeness, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.